and welcome back to another episode of The Greatest Show in the Galaxy, the show where I, the curator, discuss my personal favorite show of all time, personal favorite franchise of all time, Doctor Who. And today, um, we, we are keeping on with the, uh, uh, the streak, shall I say, of the uh, talking about different alien races from the universe of Doctor Who, and uh, full disclosure, full transparency, because I don't like to keep anything away from the people who actually watch, the uh, five people who watch this show, I had another guest uh, scheduled uh, for today, and uh, everything was good, everything was ready, and then my guest had to uh, drop out last minute. But thankfully, my good friend, and all around floating head Ben was so kind enough to join uh, the, the, in a very last minute and step up and uh, join me on this uh, on this uh, wonderful adventure today. So, how are you doing, Mister Head Ben? Ben Head. Ben, ben. Hungry. I'm so hungry. I'm good. Man, uh, I'm good. I, I told you to get a sandwich before we start. Why are you? Never mind, never mind. We'll fix that in post. Okay, we'll we'll give you something to eat in post. But first of all, thank you for coming. Thank, thank, thank you for doing this. I think this is the first time that we've done an episode of this show, just the two of us. So, yeah, so. I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to it, man. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be fun. Me too. And speaking of looking forward for things, uh, I guess some people in the world, uh, not me, but some people, uh, have one thing to look forward to every year, which is their birthdays, and uh, we will be talking about some birthdays in uh, the world of people who have been in Doctor Who uh, uh, up until now. Uh, from uh, the week, from uh, the uh, the 9th to the 15th, because the 15th, which is a Monday, is where um, traditionally this is where the episode of, of the show uh, drops, but lately in the past couple of weeks, our good friend Soda appears to be uh, have developed a fault, and uh, the, the episodes haven't exactly gone where they should have. But you know, here's a uh, wishful thing. So, starting us off uh, on August 9th, we actually have someone we will be talking about in, later in the episode today uh, uh, an actress by the name of Daniela Denby Ashe. I really hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, she appeared in, in an episode of Torchwood. And uh, like I said, we will be discussing her character in, in greater detail later in the episode. So no point in... Uh, so you know, just to be continued. To be continued. Next, we have sadly a woman who has only done two. Rather, two and a half. Two episodes... And a special we don't talk about on this show uh, for Doctor Who, but she created and originated a great character that was supposed to return in Big Finish, but sadly uh, the uh, the actress passed away a few weeks before they actually started recording it, so they had to recast her. And I'm of course referring to the wonderful late great Kate O'Mara. She played uh, the Rani in both the Six Doctors era and the seventh doctor's era and obviously like i said the character while the actress is no longer with us sadly the character lives on through uh, the magic of big finish uh next we have a person whose name is actually credited on literally every single episode of doctor who ever made the man himself ron grainer the who wrote uh, the Doctor Who theme song, theme tune, uh, which was obviously later um, uh, composed properly by Didier Darusha, but yeah, this is the man who wrote the iconic music of Doctor Who, and uh, is mainly the reason I'm a Doctor Who fan today, and is the main reason why I'm right here, sitting here, doing this show today. Uh, next, we have Sharon D. Clark. Uh, she played the character Grace in uh, Jodie Whittaker's debut episode, the woman who felt worth, she, and she continued to sort of reprise the role in various different Jodie Whittaker related episodes. She's technically speaking not really a companion, but she sort of is. So, 
I figured she should be on, on the list today. Uh, he, he played that one, he played that one person, like mother or stepmother, right? No, she played uh, the other companion's grandmother. Uh, okay, not her. Is the step-grandfather. Okay. And uh, on uh, July, August 12th, very complicated person to talk about, especially within the context of Doctor Who, but it's John Nathan Turner, the producer slash showrunner of sorts for Doctor Who from, what is it, 1980 to 1989. So yeah, this guy was the showrunner basically for four doctors. He was uh, brought on as, well, first of all, he was sort of a production assistant uh, during the 60s and 70s, but he was really brought on as a proper uh, produ main producer and showrunner in Tom Baker's final season, and then he continued on to be the producer for Peter Davison, Colin Baker, and uh, Sylvester McCoy. So, uh, yeah. We're not really going to get into a lot of the complicated stuff that this man was involved with during his, involved, during his time on the show, but the guy kept the show alive for nine years. So I think we should at least uh, consider that. So for the relatively short list of people we have today, thank you all. We quite literally could not do this without you. Now let's talk about aliens. I'm going to put this side down because it keeps making noises that annoys me. Uh, I uh, uh, oh, oh wait, wait, hold on, hold on. <laughs> yeah, uh, I came, yeah, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so, um, first off, we uh, like I said, li like we've been doing for the past uh, two weeks. I have uh, picked out six individual alien races and species. I wrote a bunch of uh, a bunch of notes for them, and I'm just going to discuss uh, these aliens with uh, my guest here, Ben. And uh, as you've probably seen, oh yeah, apparently he's got a hand now. So uh, yeah, that's something I didn't know. I thought it was just a floating head in a microphone. That was, that was weird. But uh, yeah, so the first- There's no, no hand. It was all in the mind. You didn't see any. Okay, so um, past couple of weeks, uh, the first week of this of this month, I did uh, aliens from the classic era of Doctor Who, of the um, Time Lords, Sontarans, um, other stuff. Last week, I did aliens from the modern era of the show, uh, like the Ood and Jadun and uh, the Rexic Org of Albatorians. But now we're going into the spin-off realm, as the background and the thumbnail should, should have suggested by now. And the title, obviously, we will be discussing some aliens from the spin-off shows of Doctor Who, uh, namely Torchwood, The Sergi Adventures, and Class. Uh, but mostly Torchwood, because that's really where uh, the majority of these aliens came from, in primarily including the aliens that you probably have already seen in the thumbnail, The Weevils. Yeah, look at that one. So, uh, yeah. They're not kind of looking like a... Uh... Frog or toad or like, it kind of remind me of something. I can't quite put my finger on it, on my nose. I think um, in one episode of uh, Torchwood, Captain Jack describes them as uh, walks like a man, uh, face of an ape, and teeth like a shark, or something like that. I can't remember the exact description that he gives, but yeah, here's the uh, main uh, card for that I made for these guys. Species, weevils. Homeworld, unknown, like a lot of the aliens from Torchwood. Biological type, humanoids, and notable members, Janet, which this is the only one I actually have pictures for because the other two are from books, and uh, also Sonny and Big Guy. First appearance, Everything Changes, the pilot episode of Torchwood. Uh, here's another uh, really good look at what these guys look like. This is actually the first we we will we see on the show. So and, do, they, do, they, do they have hair? Uh, yeah. Look, uh, right there. 
on, on, on top of their head. I know. Okay. Wow. Wow. So, uh, yes. Uh, they are a race of unknown savage humanoids brought to Cardiff from parts unknown by the Rift. Obviously, as we know from Doctor Do Do Who, uh, there's Car Cardiff has this big, massive rift in time and space, which is where the Doctor and, and company went uh, to re uh, refuel the TARDIS on several different episodes during the Russell T. Davies era. Obviously, that rift is a problem, and so the Torchwood hub is built deep underground underneath the rift itself, and there's a team of uh, Torchwood people uh, who are being sent to deal with all kinds of alien threats and menaces that are being sent to Cardiff by uh, via the Rift. So, uh, yeah. They were given the name Weevils by the Torchwood team. Their true name is unknown due to their lack of ability to communicate. Uh, that That is more or less a, um, a direct quote from Captain Jack. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, lack of communication skills. Sorry, my bad. Uh, so, yeah. They are slightly taller than humans, but with flatter, flattened faces and sharp fang-like teeth. Uh, they were stronger and faster than humans, uh, but could be overpowered by electricity, brute force, or a specialized uh, anti-weevil spray that uh, the Torchwood team developed. Although, over time, uh, they sort of started to begin a, uh, to develop a resistance to that uh, spray because they kept using it over and over again. So, uh, sort of a, like a natural immunity. Uh, they had... Uh, they had lower body temperature than humans and uh, could digest almost anything, much like uh, real-world hyenas. Though they preferred meat, they normally killed by ripping up their prey's throat. So even in the show, you see them running towards um, an unsuspecting human. They just grab them by uh, the arm and the head and just by chomp on their throats like a vampire, except they just ripped out the... Um, uh, sort of try to rip out a piece of their uh, throat, killing it, k killing the human, and uh, starting to eat uh, the flesh. Mm. Uh, they were mildly telepathic and they can sense the emotions of other weevils mm. even from far away, but not across different planets. Um, it is believed they had a small degree of time sensitivity and they followed slash worship uh, people who have been brought back from the dead uh, by the resurrection gauntlet. So in this world of Torchwood, there's this uh, sort of uh, metal gauntlet that can actually bring people back to life from the dead. Uh, it was Interesting. In the, Interesting. First, the first season, but uh, the thing is that gauntlet could only work on the very recently deceased, uh, the sort of uh, where the body hasn't really begun uh, to decompose just yet. Uh, and it could only work if the glove itself was placed behind the person's head and was very, very temporary. And obviously, some people have found ways to manipulate it, but, which forced uh, the Torchwood team to destroy the gauntlet. But as all people uh, who work with gauntlets know, the thing about gloves is that they always come in pairs. So in season two, they brought in a second gauntlet with a different set of rules that uh, the, uh, the deceased person did not have to be completely dead. They used it on, on a person who was alive, or oh, sorry, who was dead for several days, almost. And then they didn't just bring brought him back to life, they brought him back kind of permanently. But he was still in a sort of a living dead situation. Unlike Jack, who just can heal any type of wound and can literally regrow his own limbs, uh, this person could not heal himself. Like, he was basically dead. He just couldn't, he couldn't breathe he could not digest anything. Uh, he couldn't heal. He was basically dead. But uh, the weevils basically worshipped him almost like a leader or as a uh, spiritual follower, which presumably is uh, derived from their mild sensitivity to time. They can sense certain things from uh, from time. Now, uh, where where are we? Uh, they be, for the most part, they wore really savage uh, loincloths when they arrived, but over time they learned uh, to steal uh, the clothes and suits from the humans that they devoured. Uh, where, 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 where am I? Uh, 
uh, my writing skills are uh, appalling, by the way. So I apologize for that. For, uh, for that. Uh, they, they would hide the remains of the humans that they hunted and would not hunt indiscriminately. Uh, they, first of all, they sized up their prey before uh, uh, before attacking it, and, and would not hunt other weevils. That's very important. Uh, they, they they don't hunt uh, each other, and in fact, uh, they sorry they, they they treated their dead with respect and would mourn them by whistling. Uh, they, they would often uh, cower at the presence of something more powerful than themselves. Believe it or not, much like all other um, uh, apex predators uh, in the modern day. And uh, yeah, so Torchwood started to round them up back all the way back in the 1870s. We built special cells uh, for them to live in with special uh, facilities like bathrooms yeah, inside one of those cells. Hold on. You can kind of see that in the picture that I used for the thumbnail. And so these, these are just one of the many uh, weevil cells that were kept in the underground area of the uh, Torchwood Hub. Uh, some people, some people believe that they are descended from future humans where all they have is their savagery and uh, um, will to kill. And... Uh, at some point in the past, several sailors have indeed turned into weevils after coming into contact with an object called uh, Object One at uh, the personal request of Queen Victoria herself, the founder of Torchwood. So uh, these are definitely the most recurring villains of, of Torchwood, even though they're not primarily main villains. They, they're mostly just uh, almost background villains in a way, but uh, they're primarily used um, as cannon fodder for the most part. So uh, what do you have to say about the weevils, Ben? I don't know. I, don't know. I, I wouldn't say thinking of might and going for a bite but there's a whole other meaning on it when they bite you in the neck. He helped creepy me, man. I don't want to run past them. You were just waiting to, to say that, didn't you? Yes, I don't know. Well, it's a good thing I came prepared with that sound, but... Uh, so, go ahead. I interrupted you. I mean... It sounds like the more you... Well, you said in your heaven, it sounds like the more you... Uh, tools against a big tools who work for a big bad against humans or something else. And yeah. sounds like they really don't have the um, something to work for themselves, and that makes sense. Yeah, it actually makes perfect sense. We don't really see that on the show, but. I believe in some of the novels, the Torchwood novels, uh, mo uh, that's more or less uh, what you were talking about. We see weevils being used as henchmen for a much uh, bigger bad. Uh, there is one episode of the show where uh, this guy sort of starts an under underground fight club with these guys. He sort of uh, kidnaps them before Torchwood can get their hands on it, and people actually pay to go several rounds in a cage with one of those guys. And more often than not, people don't really make it out of those cages. Uh, I think this is one of the, this is an example of one of those cages. People just die in those fight clubs because they don't they feel like they've got no reason to live anymore. But really anybody who you didn't really break the one rule of fight club. You never talk about fight club. Yeah, I saw it on your face as soon as I uh, as soon as I said the word fight club. But yeah, um, going back to seriousness for a bit for a, a second. This is a bit. Uh, Torchwood is at least for the first two seasons. It's a very existential crisis type of show. So people 
who get in these fight clubs really just, it's another form of suicide. People don't want to live anymore. So they go in there and try to test their metal and see if they can survive one of these guys. So, uh, yeah, you know, also, they, correct me if I'm wrong, these creatures, they don't have like the sharpest tools in their shed. Is that what you're trying to say? No. Uh, like I said, uh, like Captain Jack said, they're not very good at communicating. They're not, they're, they're, there is, there's definitely some hint of intelligence buried deep inside, but none of it was really on the surface. I mean, yeah, it sounds really interesting. Okay, so you ready to move on to the next uh, big major alien from Torchwood? Let's do it, then we can keep moving. Say hello to the Blowfish. <laughs> wow. wow, okay. You are speechless, aren't you? I okay. am. Okay, so species, Blowfish. Um, Homeworld, once again, unknown, but possibly Rigel 77. We'll talk about that later. Biological type, Pisces. Yeah, Pisces, uh, from, uh, you know, from Pisces. Pisces humanoids, notable members, Perco and Hubert Crimp, seen in this comic book page here. First appearance, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, the episode of Torchwood, not the movie. Just wanted to clarify that. Uh, but yeah, uh, so even though they're called Blowfish, and even the uh, Doctor Who wiki, actually describes them as having the head of a blowfish. I'm not a marine biologist. I'm not an expert on marine life. But that is clearly not a blowfish. That is a lionfish if I've ever seen, seen one. But, I mean, the hell do I know? I wonder, do they find in a... Is one of the great opponents, Admiral Akma? We should really do a counter of how many times I'm going to use that soundbite with you on the show today. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm in a finding mood, I guess. Well, um, I hate to do this to myself, but in Star Wars, the actual rivals of the Mon Calamari, which is um, Admiral Akbar's species, their sort of natural rivals are the Quarren, which really do bear a striking resemblance to another species that we will be talking about later in the episode. So maybe, just maybe, Ben, you might have used up that joke a little too soon. Anyways, uh, this is actually a really short one, so uh, let's just get through this really quick. So uh, humanoid with fish-like faces or heads. I don't know why I wrote faces. Uh, they have bright red skin, as you can uh, see in this picture, which is a much better uh, look at this creature. Uh, bright red skin, large crests on their heads, plus tendrils and feelers around their faces. Uh, like all fish, they had uh, gills next to their jaws, uh, and uh, they, they were also amphibian, meaning they could live on uh, land and uh, in the water, although they did have to go back into the water to revitalize themselves. Uh, uh, they were covered in algae and uh, had and had stinging yellow spodum. I read. I saw this. I, I, I saw this this word on the wiki and had no idea what it is. Spodum, spodum, spodum. Yeah. A well, I, I, I want to say something, but never mind. Keep, 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 keep. That's what you were about to say, and thank you for stopping yourself, Mister Ben. Yeah, thank you for stopping yourself. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know, I don't know why to make hands roll. Moving on, uh, they had the yellow stingers, let's put, let's put it that way. And, uh, they were more, uh, they were more vulnerable to electric shocks than, uh, humans. Possibly because, uh, they they need to be moisturized consistently. And uh, here is where, where their personalities actually come into play. 
They were really selfish, rude, and very unpredictable. Uh, they would often cause problems by swearing, stealing cars, shooting people, and doing drugs. As a matter of fact, in, in its debut episode, uh, one of them actually does steal a sports car, almost, uh, almost uh, shoots a random bystander, and um, is really, really high on cocaine. You can kind of see it on, on the guy's face. Uh, yeah, they, they were often, uh, they often behave like uh, emo teenagers throwing a fit. Uh, a, gr a group of humans uh, who were experimenting on several aliens in, in Cardiff used an army of them against Torchwood. Uh, most of them were killed, uh, but two of the remaining ones actually uh, uh, got their revenge uh, on the man responsible. Basically, after they, uh, that, that story was concluded, Captain Jack took the two remaining ones to the... Um, um, to the person responsible, and they killed him. Uh, so um, this was a, a mostly an alien uh, created specifically for Torchwood, but much like the uh, the Weevils that we've already talked about, they were primarily used as uh, cannon fodder. They were mainly just used as a distraction from the main plot, while the big bad, the main villain, in this case, particularly actually being played by uh, James Masters, who played Oh, really? Wow. In Smallville. Uh, yeah. So he sent one of these guys uh, to Cardiff to cause mayhem while he uh, did uh, the, the other part of his plan. Uh, this particular one right here uh, was met by the 11th Doctor and Amy on a, sort of like a casino world. He was a really big gambler. And as you can see, really not, uh, not really a very pleasant person to be around. Like I said, they were very, very rude. They weren't threatening as much but like i said they they did a lot of swearing and they just enjoy taking the mickey out of people they were basically they were like internet trolls but other than just you know threatening people that they're going to kill you they most probably will pick up a gun and shoot you because they really have no filter uh not in their words and not really in their actions and uh actually in their debut episode uh we get to see this wonderful moment. <laughs> so yeah, this is this is how they chose to open season two of the show. And of course this led to this follow-up moment of great comedy. Excuse me. Have you seen a blowfish driving a sports car? Just another average day in Cardiff, and I couldn't find the full clip, but right after they drove off, that old woman was like, bloody Torchwood. <laughs> uh, so I, 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 I have a question. Can I ask something? Hold on, and let me just put the mouse on the sound bite. Let me get ready. Go ahead. <laughs> is it me or does that fish and kind of look like the Hulk version of Flounder from the Little Mermaid? I have never heard that comparison. But it's a good one. It's a good one. Uh, but yeah, like, I, I don't think the species of fish that flounder is has never been explicitly said. I think they, uh, Disney just wants to keep that a bit ambiguous, but seeing as it's the, it got the head of a lionfish, probably unlikely, because if you didn't know anything about lionfish, you touch them, you're dead. So, and we do see Ariel uh, uh, hugging flounder a lot. A lot. I mean, I mean, there's plenty of fish in the sea, and they live all, and they live all under the sea. I'm here all week, folks. I'm here all week. We, we, we probably should have set up a, uh, a drinking game before we went live. But, uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Fifty. Should we move on to the next one, please? <laughs> move along. Move along. 
Yeah, that's a Star Wars reference. So, um, our next one, also from Torchwood, the Nostrovites. So, uh, yeah, do not get fooled. This is not Captain Jack. This is someone that just happens to look like him. So, in the actual card species, Nostrovites. Homeworld unknown. Again, uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, biological type, shape-shifting humanoids. Notable members, Carrie. And no, not the Carrie from the movie. Uh, first appearance, something borrowed. So, uh, yeah. Vaguely resembling humans uh, with red eyes, sharp teeth and claws, and visible blood vessels in their natural form. Hold on. You can see that one uh, right here on Gary, uh, the, the sharp teeth, claws, and the red eyes. There's another good picture of one right here. With, you can see the, the, uh, the bulging uh, blood vessels right on here on this picture. Uh, blah, 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 blah. They are carnivores that mostly eat living, living flesh. They, meaning they don't uh, uh, pursue corpses. They eat uh, their prey while still alive. Uh, yeah, ignoring corpses. I actually wrote that here. Um, the the females of the species could you could produce uh, sticky uh, web-like structures, seen in this picture right here, uh, uh, to keep their prey alive until they were hungry again. Uh, they had black blood, and they could mimic humans' exact appearance uh, by by. Sorry, exact appearance, but they could not mimic their smells. That was usually how uh, they they were discovered as being because they were sh shapeshifters and they could actually uh, look exactly like a particular human without the uh, red eyes and uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 teeth and everything else. That usually came up when they got angry and reverted back to their natural form, sort of natural form. That's what usually gave them away. But they could not mimic uh, the humans' uh, exact smells. Now, despite having two genders. They um, mainly reproduced by using a third member, which is actually a pretty interesting thing uh, for a biological creature to uh, do when you really think about it. They primarily used a host. After um, after uh, fertilizing, after the um, the female fertil had fertilized eggs, the uh, the male of the species would carry would store these eggs in an egg sac in his mouth. Here we can see uh, the egg sac, which is kind of shaped like a heart. Uh, and after finding a potential suitable host, they would uh, the male would bite the potential host, injecting them, uh, sorry, injecting the eggs into their bloodstream, and the eggs would quickly develop inside the host's body, and would appear as if the host was pregnant. Um, and beca obviously, because they are shapeshifters, uh, the the eggs would eventually uh, shapeshift to uh, mimic the appearance of a pregnant person regardless of their species. So it will, if it was, uh, as you can see in this picture, a human, it would look like the human itself is pregnant. If it was a something like small, let's say, uh, let's say for example, a, a dog, it would look like a pregnant dog because every, every species uh, looks pregnant in a different uh, way. So, uh, hold on. Uh, now, uh, when the newborn was ready, was uh, ready to be born, the female of the species would track down the potential host, or rather the infected host, and rip uh, the host wide open, releasing the newborn, and would then uh, pr proceed to feast on the host's body as its first meal. Uh, they they require obviously they required a genetic sample um, of their uh, potential victim in order to shape shift into whatever uh, they they looked like, uh, and uh, they. They had their brains in their abdomen. No idea why the wiki decided to uh, say it was important to bring that up. But uh, yeah, they could eat an entire human in one go. In, in, in the uh, episode itself, we see uh, uh, the, the main villain of the episode right here, Carrie, uh, proceeding to have uh, sexual intercourse with a potential human. It look, At first, it looks like she was going to uh, give him a blowjob, except he got a little bit more than uh, he bargained for. She, she starts biting off his dick, and then she just proceeded to eat his entire uh, body. And uh, in classic British fashion, she even did this. 
when she was done. So, uh, yeah. One of, one of the freakiest creatures that, uh, ever devised in the uh, Doctor Who universe. Anything you would, you would like to add to that? I guess uh, if you ever read one that looks like you, I guess you can say it's a bad reflection of yourself. Yeah, I suppose you could. Yeah. You don't, you don't get a sound bite for that, Ben. Go ahead. Try harder <laughs> next time. Uh, these creatures sound scary as a, uh, I wouldn't want to meet one. I wouldn't want to get anything. I'm sorry, I may have, I'm not going to hear my heard you. Did you say they could infect anybody, men or female? Well, in the episode itself, we only see them uh, impregnate a female character, that being um, uh, Gwen from the Torchwood team, but it hasn't really been stated that they can't impregnate uh, ma male characters, so who knows? Maybe maybe Arnold Schwarzenegger would show up on the show one day and then we can find out. Why Arnold Schwarzenegger? Didn't he do an episode? Oh, oh, oh yeah. He was a freaking... Junior. Junior. Mama? Oh. One of the freakiest... Well, one of the freakiest payments in movie history. We know, we don't need to talk about that. Yeah, we don't. We don't. Yeah. Well, that's about it. Uh, no, 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 having part of a lump in that movie. Anything else you'd like to add? Uh, regarding the species we have today, though, let's not let's not talk about bad Schwarzenegger movies. Yeah. No, I don't have anything that much to add about these creatures. I'm sorry. Okay, all right. It, it's, that's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, like they always say, smoke them if you have them. And uh, if, if you don't, if you don't got the joke, then. Uh, uh, let's move on to the next one. Maybe we'll find some good things to laugh about with this one. This is actually pretty interesting because it's the so far it's the only uh, alien that has appeared in both Torchwood and Sarah Jane Adventures, but this did not make a physical appearance in Doctor Who, which is pretty interesting, I think. Uh, the Arcatinians. We sl slightly talked about them last week, but uh, yeah. Species Arcatinians. Homeworld, surprise, surprise, not unknown anymore. The Arcatine system. Technically, in the wiki says Arcatine 5, but there's also an Arcatine 4. Uh, so I didn't want to, uh, it doesn't really expand on that too much. So I just said the Arcatine system, because maybe there are several pl planets where the Arcatinians can be found in. Uh, yeah, so biological type, translucent humanoids, uh, notable members, Mary, which we've talked about the actresses having a birthday uh, this week, and the star poet, which made its appearance in uh, the debut, uh, the first episode of uh, Sir Jane Adventures, and its first appearance is in an episode called Greeks Bearing Gifts in Torchwood. So, um... Uh, I, I'm sorry, I... Can you bring up that picture again? You hit it the humanoid? But I don't see a party. Uh, hold on. How about now? Uh, okay, I see it in that one, but not the other one. Yeah, because you're seeing them from below. It's uh, the pictures are just cuts off uh, right below okay. the the press uh, area. But it says here in the card, translucent humanoids. Oh, uh, right, oh, right, 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 right. It's hard to see there. You can clearly see the shape of a humanoid body, a slender humanoid body, but it's very see-through. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I mean that translucent part. Okay. That really adds to uh, the beauty of what these uh, creatures look like. Uh, so yeah, they could take over human bodies in order to blend in, in on Earth-like planets where humans uh, are around, which is why uh, the character Mary is uh, seen right here uh, in human form. The, the, this was a, an Arcatinian. This one to be specific. It landed on Earth in the 1800s and took over a human body, uh, the body of a prostitute, and stayed alive all the way to the, into the uh, 21st century. Uh, now, uh, in order to maintain their shape, 
on planets with a strong gravitational field than their own, named the Earth. They require large amounts of uh, energy. Uh, their internal structure can be seen through their uh, translucent blue skin. A lot, as we can see in this picture right here. Yep. Uh, they have five slender figures on each hand, uh, tendril-like hair, and some have uh, wit have obtained uh, sorry, some have wings enabling them to fly. I think you can see it in this picture. This is a much better picture of what they look like. And as you can see, they're much, much taller than an average human. Yeah. Uh, uh, they have superhuman strength and speed, even when using uh, the uh, the human host body, like in this in the case of Mary here. Um, they also have telepathy and uh, the ability to inhabit human bodies for hundreds of years uh, without uh, the host body aging. Uh, like I said, uh, this body was taken over in the 1800s, and it still pretty much remained unchanged uh, till uh, 2006 or seven, where whenever the uh, Episode itself takes place in. Uh, hold on. So, what you're saying is, since the woman was implanted here, they got, they got a pretty good deal on that money, I'm thinking. I think I'm getting better at this. I think I'm getting better at uh, predicting when you're going to say something. Uh, 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 they have. Uh, Okay, so that's it for their biology. Uh, they have various uh, faster than light uh, uh, methods of travel. Uh, first of all, in the 1800s, which is where we first see them uh, in the episode of 1800s Earth time, they used a, a small handheld device, seen in this picture right here, uh, that could teleport them, uh, sorry, they could teleport the user plus one passenger across space it was mainly used to transport uh, uh, the main Arcatinian scene in the episode and her uh, jailer because she was a prisoner. Uh, I'm going to say something that might I'm not going to. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Hold on. I, I, I kind of want to have one she's having. Well, I probably wouldn't want to have what she's having because in that particular moment, uh, right here, she's being transported to the sun. Uh, oh. Moving on. Uh, so they, uh, they, but uh, that particular uh, handheld device uh, needed a constant supply of dark matter in order to work. In the uh, 1980s, Earth time, uh, they had, uh, by, by that point, they had developed large and elegant crafts with suspended animation pods and, and, and a double battery pack for power, which was seen actually in a Doctor Who episode. So again, we get a mention of them. We get we can see some of their technology in Doctor Who, but we don't really see them physically. Uh, and by the early 2000s, Earth time, they've already developed telepathic... Uh, sorry, they, 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 they've sort of developed the ability to fly off-planet uh, without the use of technology, mainly using their wings, as seen in, in the uh, first episode of the Sergian Adventures. But uh, we only see her leave uh, the planet. We only go see her getting into orbit. We don't really know how if she actually flew all the way into her back to her home planet. So uh, yeah, they uh, they use telepathic pendants uh, in order to uh, communicate with each other telepathically, uh, and small. Superluminal uh, uh, devices to communicate across planets. Uh, it is believed they were once a savage race that worshipped temple-like cities, sorry, temples, temples the size of cities, and had execution squads roaming the streets who executed anyone who has committed even the smallest crime. Uh, but they, but by the early 21st century, uh, they have uh, they have become a race of benevolent poets, spreading their poetry. Across the galaxy, which is what we've seen in uh, the Sergi adventures, primarily by, you know, by use of uh, this device right here. Uh, so, oops. So uh, the character Mary said she uh, she was a prisoner on her home planet. She escaped uh, her home planet using uh, the uh, uh, the device right here. Her and her jailer uh, they basically have a method of burying their. Uh, 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 prisoners of war 
on what they consider savage and barren like plants, which is what they tried to do with the Fisher King in the Doctor Who episode uh, before the flood. But uh, in this episode in particular, she escaped and she killed her jailer, took over the body of a prostitute, and uh, basically lived for about 200 years until she uh, obtained the uh, device itself and tried to use it to go back to the home planet. But Captain Jack messed with the device uh, and changed the coordinates, sending her directly into the sun, and she burned up on, uh, on arrival, presumably. Uh, but yeah, like I said, they used these pendants uh, uh, because they can't really speak with their uh, mouths, apparently. The, uh, they need to use the pendants to basically read each other's minds, but because they're much more adept in, in using it than humans, uh, they can actually pick out uh, the thoughts that they want uh, the people to, uh, to hear. And uh, uh, during uh, the 200 years that, she, uh, that um, this character lived on Earth, she primarily ate hearts. She just walked with the people and could literally rip the person's heart from their rib cage, pull it out, and eat it. And uh, at the risk of a uh, Temple of Doom or Once Upon a Time joke, I'm, I've got my finger ready on the sound bite. Go ahead, Ben. I, I wouldn't say helping, but I'm breaking my heart. Thank you for that. Uh, anything else to add? Also, um, well, actually, let's save that for the next one. Let's save that for the next one. Uh, anything else to add? I'm good, man. Uh, let's, move, let's move along. Okay, now for one that's exclusively Sarah Jane Adventures. And I can't wait to see your, your reaction to this one. Say hello to The Bane. I... I'm speechless. Oh, that's a first. That's a first. Okay, so species, the Bane. Home world, Bane world. Biological type, shelled cephalopods. Uh, notable members, the Bane mother, Mrs. Warwood, Davy, Cal Claiborne, Kilburn, sorry, Kilburn, Major Cl Kilburn, and technically, technically, Luke Smith, the adopted son of uh, Sarah Jane Smith. But like I said, technically. First episode, Invasion of the Bane. Uh, so uh, they were large, green, uh, cephalopod-like creatures with seven tentacles, three on each side plus one at their backside. Uh, they had one large eye and rings of tentacles around their uh, mouth, and a flexible turtle-like shell on their backs. Uh, they, they had uh, these pads. I uh, don't have a picture for that right now, but okay. And these top pads, they were very similar to an octopus's suction cups, which uh, allowed them to uh, uh, walk freely on the, the walls and ceilings, just as well as uh, on the ground. A single Bane brood was made up of a Bane mother and uh, her children. The Bane mother, while not seeming to uh, display the same level of intelligence as any of her children, uh, she um, uh, she laid the eggs that her children hatched from, as well as secreting the uh, the Bane chemical, which would uh, which is an enzyme that could be used to control the minds of lesser beings once they consumed it. Uh, they were very vulnerable to communicate to uh, communication devices such as phones and the Arcatinian uh, superluminal, uh, superluminal, sorry, superluminal communication device, which is how they defeated them in the episode. Uh, uh, and uh, they have white, creamy colored blood once the uh, once the, uh, they die, uh, and uh, when they get wounded. Uh, they secrete a sticky black slime from their bodies. Uh, when a Bane individual failed to carry out their tasks, uh, they would be eaten by their superiors. They, they also had a saying, which is, the sweetest delicacy is the tongue of an enemy who looked at you and licked their lips. In the early 21st century, a Bane who tried to take over uh, London uh, by producing a soft drink named Bubble Shock, 
laced with the Bain enzyme while also creating uh, a genetically engineered uh, archetype, Luke Smith, uh, to, uh, uh, which was a clone with the mind of 10,000 humans, uh, which was their attempt to find out why 2% of humans developed an immunity to the enzyme and therefore unable to uh, be controlled. Uh, after this failed, uh, they tried to obtain pieces of uh, the immortal tyrant Horath uh, with the help of the Sontaran bounty hunter Commander Cog. Uh, they were stopped both times by Sarah Jane Smith and the Bannerman Roll again. So, uh, yeah, basically, if, uh, like I said, they eat uh, the people that failed them, even if they happen to be from their own group, which sort of kind of feels like, um, first of all, it's barbaric, but. They're mostly about the same size uh, as one another. So if one fails uh, the rest of the brood and the other ones are, are showing up to try to kill them and eat them, couldn't he just eat them back? That, that never really made much sense to me. But as it is seen in the episodes themselves, they could use a holographic image uh, translator to uh, appear as humans, which is I, I would recommend better. Uh, I, I would say it's much better disguise technology than most aliens in Doctor Who. But uh, yeah, so Luke Smith was uh, a clone uh, from uh, from their facilities, which was then uh, he was released by uh, Maria ja the intervention of Maria Jackson, and was adopted uh, by Sarah Jane Smith as her son. So, like I said, technically he's not really a Bane, but since they created him, I decided to lump him into that whole uh, conversation. But uh, I, I don't know, me and Bane sounds like a mighty back blinking <sighs> anything else you know, I, I, I like the sound of these pictures they sound pretty interesting pretty intimidating not, maybe not the smartest pictures on this list well, maybe the more strategic and that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I suppose. Well, well, you could make the argument about the next one on this list, but yeah, they're very, they're very, uh, very strategic. Like they very clearly had a plan from the get-go. Just happens to run into one of the uh, Doctor's companions. And we Stop. know from movies, it's only good to have a plan. You don't get one without one. No, I didn't say that to be funny. And unlike the Big Bang Theory, it's not funny because it's true. Next. So, uh, the next and final alien that we will be talking about today made their debut, and so far, only appearances on the spin-off show Class, and they're actually kind of the main villains on that show. Uh, a lot of people really don't talk very fondly about this show, and I honestly don't know what they're smoking because I love Class. I loved it when I first watched it, and I loved it again when I rewatched it for the big rewatch that the, the three of us did for uh, the uh, Doctor Who recap show that we never uh, finished, but. I like the show. I don't understand why people hate it, but uh, yeah, of course I'm talking about. You look like you were about to say something, so go ahead and say. It. No, I, I did. In talking about class, I have heard mixed stuff about that show. I never watched it myself, but yeah, and I don't want to say hate it, but I heard not so good things about it. Again, I don't understand why people didn't like it as much. Like, I, I liked it. I liked it a lot. And the main problem is it left on the mother of all cliffhangers. And it was very apparent that they were making a season two. Like, I think back in the day, Patrick Ness, the creator of the show, who I believe was also the screenwriter for uh, A Monster Calls, he was on uh, Collider, who was interviewed by uh, oh, no. Mark Ellis. He was, Mark Ellis interviewed him. He asked him uh, uh, what are some other projects he's working on, and he literally says, and he's working on a season two for class, which never happened. 
So they were clearly working on it, and then they nixed it in the bud. Uh, no, no, you hate it. No, you hate it. Tell me more. It's time caption here. No, no, you hate it when the show ends on a cliffhanger, then it never comes back. I understand the, the appeal of ending uh, the first season on a cliffhanger, but maybe it's smarter to do that when you know you're getting a second season. Oh, you know what? I know a show that ended in the third season. It ended? Yeah. Oh. What a it bummer. sucks. And yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, tell me about going on that tangent right there, but I think I think I, I pretty much led that tangent. But anyways, say hello to the Shadowkin. Ooh, I like that one. Yeah. That, again, one of my favorite parts about that show, which I also really, really liked. Uh, so yeah, species Shadowkin. Once again, not uh, their homeworld is not unknown. It's the underneath biological type, shadow-based humanoids. Notable members, sorry, Corey Kynes, April McLean, and Chorus. First appearance for tonight. We may we might die. So yeah. Uh, Believing themselves to be a mistake that shouldn't have happened. Uh, uh, this is me saying it. This is this is their belief. They believe that they were a mistake that happened when uh, they, they should never have existed in the universe of life because they are shadow-based creatures. Uh, the Shadowkin made them made numerous invasions from their dimension, the underneath, into what they call the universe of light, uh, feeling that if they don't destroy the universe. It will destroy them, so you know they just wanted to uh, not destroy the universe first before uh, it destroys them. Uh, they could mainly exist as pure shadows, uh, unnoticed and untouched, and untouchable. Uh, if the person casting their shadow would uh, die, they would uh, they would also perish as a result, uh, and they could also take uh, solid form in order uh, in order to kill their victim and. Kill their victims, uh, uh, the, sh the shadow casters. Uh, to do so, they they had to they had the ability to produce uh, scimitars from their hands, as you can see right here in this picture. They could literally create these swords from their hands at any given moment, uh, at will. Like I said, uh, they could also not exist. Uh, they could neither exist in neither their. Um, their shadow form, or in their physical form, uh, in a place where, where in, a, in a place where there were no shadows, or rather bright light, where uh, the casting of shadows was impossible. Uh, the best way to kill a shadow pin uh, that is taking physical form is by using a displacement gun, seen in the picture right here. Uh, displacement gun, uh, which is a a, a weapon. That would latch on to the, uh, the wielder's hands and fire at both the targets as well as the user's hearts uh, to destroy both uh, both shadow and shadow caster at the same time. Basically, it's a gun. It's sort of I, 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 you aim it at uh, the shadow pin. It literally binds itself to your hand, making you unable to let go. And then it would just shoot the shadow pin and shoot you at the same time. And both of you would die. It would particularly aim towards your hearts to stop both of you at the same time. That's really the only so, way. Yeah, pretty much. He's Peter Pan's worst nightmare. Are you even listening to me or are you just spending most of the time just thinking about jokes? No, I'm, I'm curious to know at this point. <laughs> I'm sorry, Fanny. Ah, I invite you here. I thought we were going to have a nice discussion about some aliens and you make a mockery of this show. Uh, where was I? Um, so, okay, so an army of Shadow Kid uh, invaded the planet Rhodia uh, at the height of the war between the Rhodians and uh, the Quill. As you can see, both in this picture, the Rhodians are on the 
the left, sorry, on the right, and the cooler on the right. Not to be confused with the Rodians from Doc from Star Wars, because yeah, they they don't make any attempt to even hide the fact that both species st- sound the same. Well, I I do have a question. This isn't a short time comment. Can we come to the pictures again? Which is which? Like I said, the one on the right is the Rodian, and the one on the left is a quill. The one with the spikes mm-hmm. is a quill. Okay. Me, me for you said they were more on the right. So I, I got confused. Yeah, so like I said, not to be confused with Rodians from Star Wars, because they really do sound the same. Uh, Rodians are basically the, uh, the Guido. As uh, Star okay. called him, Rito from uh, Star Wars. Uh, McClunky. There, I, I beat you to it. Uh, so they invaded the planet Rodia at the height of the, uh, the the war between the Rodians and the Quill and drove both races to near extinction. These two ones that we see right here in this picture, these are the only two surviving members of the species of both races. Uh, uh, they then uh, followed the two remaining survivors through, sp- through a space-time rift into the Coal Hill School in London uh, and became intertwined. And uh, their leader, uh, the Shadow King, uh, Korakinus, in this picture right here, standing next to the doctor, uh, he became uh, sort of intertwined with a schoolgirl named April McLean. And uh, remember when I said earlier, we were talking about earlier about the gun? So yeah. uh, I I think this is right. I think this might be her shooting at, at him in this picture. So uh, the the prince of the Rodians sort of tried to stop her from shooting herself. Bumped off the gun. She shot at his heart, but she missed her own heart in the process, meaning she splintered his heart all over the universe. But he still stayed alive because they were both sharing the same heart. It's a very complicated thing, but she she basically she was sharing a heart with Korikinus, the uh, the shadow kin, shadow king, I should say. And so, if something happened to her heart, he would also die. And if something happened to him, uh, she would also die. They were basically they were sharing the same heart. It's a very confusing thing, but it it, it kind of reminds me of that one season of One Hundred Upon a Time. You didn't show me in snow, snow heart. Yeah, they, they were sharing uh, the same heart. Basically, you kind of, kind of uh, yeah, you pretty much nailed, nailed it on the head with that uh, good on you. So, uh, yeah, April McLean, uh, after being driven, uh, they were driven back into the, the underneath by the doctor, poor kind of attempted a second invasion of Earth. Uh, but then April went to the underneath. And defeated him in battle, and she became the, uh, the next king of the, sh- the the new king of the Shadow King, uh, Shadow Kin, and she ordered all of them to go back uh, to their. Uh, she she ordered him to be imprisoned in the underneath and uh, forbade the rest of the sh- uh, the Shadow King uh, uh, from uh, invading Earth again. Uh, but. Uh, as with uh, most, uh, as, as is the case with, most, uh, with a lot of episodes of Doctor Who, he eventually uh, escaped and regained command of his armies, came back to try and exact his revenge. Uh, then the, lo- the le- uh, last Rodian of uh, uh, the last surviving Rodian uh, wiped out the entire Shadow Kin by using the Cabinet of Souls. Do you know what the Cabinet of uh, Here we go. Do you know what the Cabinet of Souls is, Ben? Yeah, yeah, I knew. It looked familiar, though. Well, uh, since I'm not very good at explaining certain things, I'm going to leave this up to the doctor. Doctor, tell us, what is the cabinet? Oh, the cabinet? Oh, that's easy. There's this painfully strange shop here called Ikea. The Cabinet of Souls. Uh, sorry, wrong clip. Uh, the, sh- the Cabinet of Souls, not just any cabinet. Yeah, here we go. It's the center of the Rodian religion. The soul of every Rodian who dies is supposed to go there. It's a repository for a future paradise. And a weapon. Yes, that too. So basically, whenever a Rodian dies, 
their soul is being kept inside this cabinet in sort of a uh, sort of pocket universe where they can roam around forever. But as the uh, the Shadow King mentions, it can also be used as a weapon. It's the power of all that life crammed down into single specks of light could be enough to destroy an entire species. Which, as I mentioned, the Rodian Prince Charlie used it um, to kill, to wipe out all the Shadowkin in uh, both realms. Uh, after which, April, uh, the girl who was sharing a heart with the uh, Shadowkin Polykinus, uh, well, she died slightly before that, but then she was resurrected in the body of Cory Kynes. And uh, that, that was most basically the end of the the end of season one of the show. She was resurrected, but she came back inside the body of the Shadow King. Shadow King. That's where they left the heroes of the show off. And then the Weeping Angels showed up, and it turns out that they were behind everything that happened all along, and that they were trying to bring about to sort of fulfill the promise, the prophecy of this gigantic, massive, huge, mountain-sized weeping angel that was coming back from the dawn of time. And that's the cliffhanger. That's how the show ends. There were the weeping angels all along. Yeah. yeah. And that's how they ended the freaking show. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what, what the uh, hell? Uh, there had to be some, I hate to use the word, fan fiction or big finish that continues that snow is all right. Yes, and they already did four series of it, four seasons of it. And they, uh, the, the, the class gang, which is uh, nicknamed uh, the Coal Hill Defenders, have even faced off against Daleks in the in one of those episodes. But that, oh. but that is a story for another time. I was saying that for the segue, but uh, yeah. So nothing else to add before we wrap up the show. The what was the evil king's name? The head one. Uh, Coven kindness. Is it me or does he kind of look like a dark elf from the dark world? Mm, nah, I don't think so. I mean, you can, you can see his eyes very clearly. He has got really bright red eyes. He almost looks like right. volcano creatures. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. I love about them. I love that this sort of burning effect whenever they're standing around. You, uh, you can't really see it in a static image. Let me just bring up, uh, let's see if I can bring up one of those clips again. Oh, the cabinet. Oh, that's easy. There's this painfully strange shop here called Ikea. The cabinet of souls. Oops. I love that. I, I love that. That was good. Yeah, I, I, I love the, the 12 Doctors humor. But yeah, you can see the uh, the burning effect around the, uh, the creatures. It's really good looking effect when you when you see it on the show itself and they they use that spe species a lot in that one se single season but no I, I i'm not really getting much the um uh dark elf vibes but that's just me um, no maybe i guess that just me but when yeah uh, they sound really they sound very methodical and strategic and scary, to be honest with you. Yeah. No, they were very, very spooky. But, uh, yeah, like I said, that was a story for another day. I think it's time to wrap up the show. Uh, that's everything. Uh, that's, unless, unless there's one, one last final thing you want to add. I didn't want to say thank you so much for having me, family. This was really fun. Oh no! Thank you, thank you for uh, offering to uh, to fill in for uh, the other guest that I uh, was supposed to be here. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. I, think I was uh, I was getting nervous there for a second there when they told me that they had to drop out, but uh, thankfully I've got such great friends. And in that, in the, in the time you need me, I'll be here. Yeah, and I will see you two weeks from now for the uh, 
the sexy companions uh t ranking list. yeah yeah, yeah wait for that one that, that that one's gonna be pretty fun so uh anyways uh let's let's get uh, your plugs out of the way because you got way more than me you guys can find me at my Infinite Pen on this go radio. You can find me on my YouTube channel, um, Morning Wizard Kingdom. Every Monday on Fellowship of the Kingdom. Every Wednesday on Jedi Academy. Every Friday on the Weekly Kingdom. Every Sunday, every Sunday on, uh, Kingdom Uncut. You guys can find me right here on this YouTube channel every Tuesday on uh, we write that tape man. every, usually every Saturday morning with 50 and our friend Soda on the New Moon Countdown. Yes, and uh, Soda can also be found on this channel on um, the Squared Slice and on the LGR Network uh, doing uh, the Blokes of Wrestling. Another show we also have on this channel is um, Have You Seen This with Daniel Snark and uh, Dave. Uh, Snark, I believe, will be here either next week for the Alien Tier Ranking List, or or will definitely be on for the uh, Sexy Companions Tier Ranking List, which I can't wait for uh, for that one. And uh, yeah, me, uh, like I said, like Ben said, on Northern Countdown every Saturday, except yeah. this week we took a, we took a break uh, this week. And I can also be found on my own YouTube channel occasionally called Fifty Shades of Geek. So uh, yeah, I think that's. That's about it for uh, for plugs. Thank you, Ben, for coming on. And uh, you get what, one final one of these. Just for fun. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, uh, you, you got ahead of me this time. So, uh, yeah, thank you all for, uh, for watching. And uh, we'll see you next week. Goodbye.